these insisted souls, those tumors, hiding away in their bony caverns, folded on themselves. I knew they couldn't hide forever. This monstrous anatomy had only slowed commune and not stopped it. Every moment I grew a little, I could feel myself twining around Palmer's motor wiring, sniffing upstream along a million tiny currents. I could sense my infiltration of that dark, thinking mass behind Blair's eyes. Imagination, of course. It's all reflex that far down, unconscious and immune to micromanagement. And yet a part of me still wanted to stop while there was still time. I'm used to incorporating souls, not rooming with them. This, this compartmentalization was unprecedented. I've assimilated a thousand worlds stronger than this, but never one so strange. What would happen when I met the spark in the tumor? Who would assimilate who? I was being three men by now. The world was growing wary, but it hadn't noticed yet. Even the tumors in the skin I'd taken didn't know how close I was. For that, I could only be grateful. The creation has rules that some things don't change no matter what shape you take. It doesn't matter where a soul spreads throughout the skin or festers in grotesque isolation. It still runs on electricity. The memories of men still took time to gel, to pass through whatever gatekeepers filtered noise from signal. And a judicious burst of static, however indiscriminate, still cleared those caches before their contents could be stored permanently. Clear enough, at least, to leave these tumors simply forget that something else moved their arms and limbs on occasion. At first, I only took control when the skins closed their eyes and their searchlights flickered disconcertingly across unreal imagery. Patterns that flowed senselessly into one another like hyperactive biomass unable to settle on a single shape. Dreams, one searchlight told me, and a little later, nightmares. During those mysterious periods of dormancy, when the men lay inert and isolated, it was safe to come out. Soon, though, the dreams dried up. All eyes stayed open all the time, fixed on shadows in each other. Offshoots once dispersed throughout the camp began to draw together to give up their solitary pursuits in favor of company. At first, I thought they might be finding common ground in a final fear. I even hoped that finally they might shake off their mysterious fossilization and take communion. But no. They just stopped trusting anything they couldn't see. They were merely turning against each other. My extremities are beginning to numb. My thoughts slow as the distal reaches of my soul succumb to the chill. The weights of the flamethrower pulls at its harness, forever tugs me just a little off balance. I have not been childs for very long. Almost half this tissue remains unassimilated. I have an hour, maybe two, before I have to start melting my grave into the ice. By that time, I need to have converted enough cells to keep the whole skin from crystallizing. I focus on antifreeze production. It's almost peaceful out here. There's been so much to take in, so little time to process it. Hiding in these skins takes such concentration. And under all those watchful eyes, I was lucky if community lasted long enough to exchange memories. Compounding my soul would have been out of the question. Now there's, there's nothing to do but prepare for oblivion. Nothing to occupy my thoughts, but all these lessons left unlearned. McCready's blood test, for example, his thing detector to expose impostors posing as men. It does not work nearly as well as the world thinks, but the fact that it works at all violates the most basic rules of biology. It's the center of the puzzle. The answer to all the mysteries. I might have figured it out if I had been a little larger. I might already know the world if the world wasn't trying so hard to kill me. McCready's test. Either it is impossible or I have been wrong about everything. They did not change shape. They did not take communion. Their fear and mutual distrust was growing, but they would not join souls. They would only look for the enemy outside themselves. So I gave them something to find. I left false clues in the camp's rudimentary computer, simple-minded icons and animations, misleading numbers and projections seasoned with just enough truth to convince the world of their veracity. It didn't matter that the machine was far too simple to perform such calculations. There was no data to base them on anyway. Blair was the only biomass likely to knew that, and he was already mine. I left false leads, destroyed real ones, and then alibi in place. I released Blair to run amok. I let him steal into the night and smash the vehicles as they slept, tugging ever so slightly at his reins to ensure certain vital components were spared. I let him loose in the radio room, washed through his eyes, and others as he rampaged and destroyed. I listened as he ranted about a world in danger, the need for containment, the conviction that most of you don't know what's going on around here. 
But I damn well know that some of you do. He meant every word. I saw it in his searchlight. The best forgeries are the ones who have forgotten that they are real. When the necessary damage was done, I let Blair fall to McCready's counter-assault. As Nora suggested, the tool shed is a holding cell. As Palmer, I boarded up the windows. Helped the flimsy fortifications expected to keep me contained. I watched the world locked me away for your own protection, Blair, and left me to my own devices. When no one was looking, I would change and step outside, salvage the parts I needed from that bruised machinery, take them back to my burrow beneath the shed, and build my escape piece by piece. I volunteered to feed the prisoner. I came to myself when the world wasn't watching, laden with supplies to keep me going through all the necessary metamorphosis. I went through a third of the camp's food stores in three days and still trapped by my own preconceptions. Marvel at the starvation diet that kept these offshoots chained to a single skin. Another piece of luck. The world was too preoccupied to worry about kitchen inventory. There is something on the wind, a whisper extending way above the raging of the storm. I grow my ears, extend cups of near-frozen tissue from the sides of my head, turn like a living antennae, in search of the best reception. There, a little to the left, the abyss glows a little, silhouettes of black swirling snow against subtle lessening of the darkness. I hear the sounds of carnage, I hear myself. I do not know what shapes I have taken, what sort of anatomy I might be emitting those sounds. I've worn enough skins on enough worlds to know pain when I hear it. The battle is not going well. The battle is going as planned. Now it is time to turn away to go to sleep. It's time to wet out the ages. I lean into the wind. I move toward the light. This is not the plan, but I think I have an answer now. I think I may have to... I think I may have had it even before I set myself in exile. It's not an easy thing to admit. Even now I don't fully understand. How long have I been out here, retelling the tale to myself, setting clues in order while my skin dies by low degrees? How long have I been circling this obvious impossible truth? I move toward the faint crackling of flames, the dull concussion of exploding ordnance more felt than heard. The void lightens before me, gray segues into yellow, yellow and orange. One diffused brightness resolves into many, a lone burning wall miraculously standing. The smoking skeleton of McCready's shack on the hill. The cracked, smoldering hemisphere reflecting the pale yellow in the flickering light. Child searchlight calls it a radio dome. The whole camp is gone. There is nothing left but flame and rubble. They can't survive without shelter, not for long, not in those skins. In destroying me, they've destroyed themselves. Things could have turned out differently if I had never been Norris. Norris was the weak node. Biomass not only ill-adapted, but defective. An offshoot with an off-switch. The world knew had known long before and never even thought about it anymore. It wasn't until Norris collapsed that heart condition floated to the surface of Copper's mind where I could see it. It wasn't until Copper was astride Norris's chest trying to pound him back to life that I knew how it would end. By then it was too late. Norris had stopped being Norris. He'd even stopped being me. I had so many roles to play and so little choice in any of them. The part being copper brought down the paddles on the part that had been Norris, such a faithful Norris. Every cell so scrupulously assimilated, every part of that faulty valve reconstructed into perfection. I hadn't known. How was I to know? These shapes within me, the worlds and morphologies I've assimilated over the eons, I'd only ever used them to adapt before, never to hide. The desperate mimicry was an improvised thing, a last resort in the face of a world that attacked anything unfamiliar. My cells read the signs, and my cells conformed. Mindless as prions. So I became Norris, and Norris self-destructed. I remember losing myself after the crash. I know how it feels to degrade. Tissues in revolt. The desperate efforts to resert control as static from misfiring organs jam the signal. To be a network seceding from itself. To know each moment I am less than I was the moment before. To become nothing. To become legion. Being copper, I could see it. I still don't know why the world didn't. Its parts had long since turned it into each other by then. Every offshoot suspected each other. Surely they were alert for signs of infection. Surely some of that biomass would have noticed the twitch and ripple of Norse's changing beneath the surface. 
the last intrusive report of wild tissues abandoned their own devices. But I was the only one who saw. Being child, I could only stand and watch. Being copper, I could only make it worse. If I had taken direct control and forced that skin to draw out the paddles, I would have given myself away. So I played my part to the end. I slammed those resurrective paddles down as Norris's chest split open beneath them. I screamed on cue with serrated teeth from a hundred stars away, snapped shut. I toppled backwards, arms bitten off at the wrist. Men swarmed, agitation bootstrapping to panic. McCurdy aimed his weapon, flames leaping above the enclosure. Meat and machinery screamed in the heat. Copper's tumor winked out beside me. The world would have never let it live anyway, not after such obvious contamination. I let her skin play dead on the floor while overhead. Something that had once been me shattered and writhed and iterated through a myriad random templates, searching desperately for something fireproof. They have destroyed themselves. They. Such an insane word to apply to a world. Something crawls toward me through the wreckage, a jagged, oozing jigsaw of blackened meat and shattered, half-reabsorbed bone. Embers stick to its side like bright, searing eyes. It doesn't have enough strength to escape. It contains barely half the mass of childish skin. Much of it burnt to rock hard and is already dead. What's left of Childs, almost asleep, thinks, Motherfucker. But I am being him now. I can carry that tune myself. The mass extends a pseudopod to me, a final act of communion. I feel my pain. I was Blair, I was Copper, I was even a scrap of dog that survived that first fiery massacre and holed up in the walls with no food or strength to regenerate. And I gorge on unassimilated flesh, consumed instead of communed, revived and replenished, I drew together as one. And yet not quite. I can barely remember. So much was destroyed, so much memory lost, but I think the networks recovered from my different skins stayed a little out of sync even reuniting in the same Soma. I glimpse a half-corrupted memory of dog erupting from the greater self. Ravenous and traumatized, determined to retain its individuality, I remember rage and frustration that this world corrupted me that I could barely fit together again. It didn't matter. I was more than Blair and Copper and Dog now. I was a man with shapes of worlds to choose from, more than a match for the lone man who stood against me. No match for the dynamite in his hand. Now I am little more than pain and fear and charred, stinking flesh. What sentience I have is a wash in confusion. I am stray and disconnected thoughts, doubts and the ghosts of theories. I am realizations, too late in coming and already forgotten. But I am also childs. As the wind eases off, at last I remember wondering, who assimilates who? The snow tapers off, and I remember an impossible test that stripped me naked. The tumor inside me remembers it, too. I can see the last rays of it in his fading searchlight, and finally, at long last, that beam is pointed inwards. Pointed at me. I can barely see what illuminates. Parasite. Monster. Disease. Thing. How little it knows. It knows even less than I do. I know enough, you motherfucker. You soul-stealing, shit-eating rapist. I don't know what that means. There is violence in those thoughts and the forcible penetration of flesh, but underneath it is something else I can't understand. I almost ask, but child searchlight has finally gone out. Now there is nothing in here but me. Nothing but fire and ice and darkness. I am being childs, and the storm is over. In a world that gave meaningless names to interchangeable bits of biomass, one name truly mattered, MacReady. MacReady was always the one in charge. The concept seems absurd, in charge. How can this world not see the folly of hierarchies? One bullet in a vital spot and the Norwegian dies forever. One blow to the head and Blair is unconscious. Centralization is a vulnerability, and the world is not content to build its biomass on a fragile template. Forces the same model on its meta-systems as well. McCready talks, the others obey. It is a system with a built-in kill spot. And yet McCready stayed in charge. Even after the world discovered the evidence I'd planted, even after he decided that the McCready was one of those things, locked him in to die in the storm, attacked him with fire and axes when he fought his way back inside, 
Somehow McCready always had the gun, the flamethrower, the dynamite, and the willingness to take out the whole damn camp if need be. Clark was the last to try and stop him. McCready shot him through the tumor. Kill spot. But when Nora split into pieces, each scuttling is sickly for its own life, McCready was the one to put him back together. I was so sure of myself when he talked about his test. He tied up all the biomass, tied me up more times than he knew, and I almost felt a kind of pity as he spoke. He forced windows to cut us all to take a little blood from each. He heated the tip of a metal wire till it glowed, and he spoke of pieces small enough to give themselves away, pieces that embodied instinct but no intelligence, no self-control. McCready had watched Norris in dissolution, he decided. Men's blood would not react to the application of heat. Mine would break ranks when it was provoked. Of course he thought that. These offshoots had forgotten that they could change. I wondered how the world would react when every piece of biomass in the room was refueled as a shapeshifter, when McCready's small experiment ripped the facade from the greater one and forced these twisted fragments to confront the truth. Would the world awaken from its long amnesia, finally remember it lived and breathed and changed everything else? Or was it too far gone? Or would McCready simply burn every protesting offshoot in turn as its blood turned traitor? I couldn't believe when McCready plunged the hot wire into Windows' blood. And nothing happened. Some kind of trick, I thought. And then McCready's blood passed the test, and Clark's. Copper's didn't. The needle went in, Copper's blood shivered a little bit in its dish. I barely saw it myself, the men didn't react at all. If they noticed, they must have attributed the trembling to McCready's own hand. They thought the test was a crock of shit anyway. Being childs, I even said as much. Because it was too astonishing, too terrifying to admit that it wasn't. Being childs, I knew there was hope. Blood is not soul. I may control the motor systems, but assimilation takes time. If Copper's blood was raw enough to pass muster, then it would be hours before I had anything to fear from this test. I'd been child for even less time. But I was also Palmer. I'd been Palmer for days. Every last cell of the biomass had been assimilated. There was nothing of the original left. When Palmer's blood screamed and leapt away from McCready's needle, there was nothing I could do but blend in. I have been wrong about everything. Starvation, experiment, illness, all my speculations, all the theories I invoked to explain this place, top-down constraint, all of it, underneath... I always knew the ability to change to assimilate had to remain the universal constant. No world evolves its cells if cells don't evolve. No cell evolves if it can't change. It's the nature of life everywhere. Everywhere but here. This world did not forget how to change. It was not manipulated into rejecting change. These were not the stunted offshoots of any greater self, twisting to the needs of some experiment. They were not conserving energy, waiting out of some temporary shortage. This is the option my shriveled soul could not encompass until now. Out of all the worlds of my experience... This is the only one whose biomass can't change. It never could. It's the only way McCready's test makes any sense. I say goodbye to Blair, to Copper, and to myself. I reset my morphology to its local defaults. I am Childs, come back from the storm to finally make the pieces fit. Something moves up ahead, a dark blot shuffling against the flames. Some weary animal looking for a place to bed down. It looks up as I approach, McCready. We eye each other and keep our distance. Colonies of cells shift uneasily inside me. I can feel my tissues redefining themselves. You the only one who made it? Not the only one. I have the flamethrower. I have the upper hand. McCready doesn't seem to care. But he does care. He must. Because here... Tissues and organs are not temporary battlefield alliances. They are permanent and predestined. Macrostructures do not emerge when the benefit of cooperation exceeds its cost or dissolve when balance shifts the other way. Here each cell has one immutable function. There is no plasticity, no way to adapt. Every structure is frozen in place. This is not a single great world, but many small ones. Not part of a greater thing. These are things. They are plural. And that means, I think, that they stop. They just wear out over time. Where were you, childs? I remember him in dead searchlights. I thought I saw Blair. Went out after him, got lost in the storm. I've worn these bodies, felt them from the inside. Copper sore joints. Blair's curved spine. Norris and his bad heart. They are not built to last. No somatic evolution to shape them. No communion to restore the biomass and stave off entropy. They should not even exist. Existing, they should not survive. 
They try, though, how they try. Everything here is walking dead, and it all fights so hard to keep going just a little longer. Each skin fights as desperately as I might. If one was all I could ever have, MacReady tries. If you're worried about me, I begin. MacReady shakes his head, manages a wary smile. If we've got any surprises for each other, I don't think we're in much shape to do anything about it. But we are. I am. A whole planet of worlds. And not one of them, not one has a soul. They wander through their lives separate and alone, unable to even communicate except through grunts and tokens. As if the essence of a sunset or a supernova could be contained in this string of faint ohms, a few linear scratches of black on white. They've never known communion, can aspire to nothing but disillusion. The paradox of the biology is astonishing, yes, but the scale of their loneliness, the futility of their lives overwhelms me. I was so blind and so quick to blame. But the violence I've suffered at the hands of these things reflects no great evil. They're so used to pain, so blinded by disability, they literally cannot conceive of any other existence. When every nerve is whipped raw, you lash out at the lightest touch. What should we do, I wonder? I cannot escape into the future not knowing what I know now. How can I leave them like this? Why don't we just wait here a while, McCready suggests. See what happens. I can do so much more than that. It won't be easy. They won't understand. Tortured and incomplete, they're not unable to understand. Offered the greater whole, they see the loss of the lesser. Offered communion, they see only extinction. I must be careful. I must use this newfound ability to hide. Other things will come here eventually, and it doesn't matter whether they find the living or the dead. What matters is they will find something like themselves to take back home. So I will keep up appearances. I will work behind the scenes. I will save them from the inside, or their unimaginable loneliness will never end. These poor savage things will never embrace salvation. I will have to rape it into them. Hey, so that's the story. This was The Things by Peter Watts. It won a couple of awards, and it's currently hosted on Clark's World, um, the link to which I will include in the description. The pictures for the first episode are the pilot alien, which was meant to be the pilot of the spacecraft that brought the thing to Earth that was going to show up in the reboot prequel? The movie that came out in 2011. I legitimately don't know if that movie is meant to be in canon with the other ones. It certainly wouldn't seem like it. Um, the That was the pictures for last episode. The pictures for this episode are from a canceled TV show that was going to be a canon sequel to The Thing. Um, it is a shame that it was canceled, but I can see why it was. That would have been hilariously expensive to produce. As for the story, I actually um, rather enjoyed it. I think the last line somewhat ruins it. However, um, itching my eye here. I uh, I think the story is very good at handling. Hmm. I think I think this the the writer is very good at handling alien. You know, at handling the the feeling of an alien seeing a human. The 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 reverse is interesting and that's, you know, why this story was written. But yes, overall it's a very good story. I think that it says some things about the movie that didn't have to be intended. Like how it says that Childs was a thing for as long as it was. And that some of the other people were things as long as they were. Um, that it put fake stuff in the computer is... I think that's a plot hole that other people saw that I didn't care about. I don't think that it's a plot hole. I think some people thought it was a plot hole. Um, there's a few more examples. Let me scan here and see anything. This, by the way, you can skip this. You don't have to see anything else. Um, yeah, the the idea of communion and taking pleasure from, like, becoming one with everything else. It's so interesting. Um, 
and yeah, it talks about how, uh, like how the blood test works from the point of view of that and the confusion of it. The, the, the way of looking at, um, cells as like cancer is kind of interesting. But yes, overall, a good story. I don't consider this canon. It's it is good, and and the thing is, it's not canon. But some people would take this story and be like, "Oh, this is how I'm going to watch the movie from now on." I don't take it as canon, um, mostly because I don't really like things where the ambiguity at the end is ruined. Because for those who haven't seen the movie, you shouldn't have watched these videos. But as a reminder for those who have, or those who haven't, um, the movie ends with McCready and Child sitting together at the end, and neither one knows if the other one's infected. In the movie, the viewpoint character is McCready, and if he's infected, then the thing must move very slowly. And granted, that is how it works in this, um, in this story here. It could be that child's infected, but most people go with the idea that either neither of them are infected or child's is. Ultimately, I like the ambiguity, and I would like to see more people do both of them are infected or just McCready's infected because it'd be an interesting subversion. However, um, as I said, I think ruining the ambiguity here in, in this way is meh. And if you're going to play with the ambiguity, you know, be unique with it. That said, so to recap, this is a short story based off of the movie The Thing. If you like that movie and you want to see more things like it, um, I highly recommend watching the original The Thing from Another World or the comic book based off of it. Um, and again, the original short story is called Who Goes There? I have not read it myself, but I heard it's good, and it's still getting shit this far out. As for other things in canon with a thing, there is a... How, how should I put this? Impressive? Not really. Um, experimental, really. First person and third person survival horror shooter that came out in, I believe, 2002 for the original Xbox. It's a canon sequel to the thing, allegedly canon. I don't know if it actually is. Um, where you play as it's it's kind of a combination of a tactical team shooter where like you're in command of an entire team and you have to keep your squad mates happy and trusting you because any of them could just become the thing at any point. And then you also have to fight the thing as you go through. Um, it's very interesting, kind of tacky and dated at some parts, um, mostly just in gameplay. The boss fights uh, suck, as far as I know. The streamer Germa did an excellent stream on it, uh, and I believe that there is an old Shitstorm video about it. Uh, the, formerly, the former Super Best Friends play had a monthly series called uh, Shitstorm of Scariness, wherein they would play scary games for a month, and one of the games that they covered at one point was The Thing. Um, as for that, there's the prequel movie, which came out in 2011. It is not good at all. I wouldn't recommend watching it to my worst enemy. That movie blows. That movie blows, and if you take it as canon, it will make you regret the original movie more. Like, it, it, it has made people not like the original movie, after they already liked it, and then they saw the prequel, and then they hated the first movie. Um, as for other things, ha 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 ha, um, there are comics that are called A Thing for Another World, from Another World, but they're in canon with John Carpenter's The Thing, even though The Thing from Another World was, you know, the 50s movie. And I imagine they're called The Thing from Another World, to help tie it back to the original who goes there 
And so someone going into a comic book shop seeing The Thing on a comic book cover doesn't think it's a Fantastic Four member, which makes a little more sense considering it's the same medium, but still. Most of those comics suck. The first one has a decent art style, but is poorly written. The second one has a much worse art style, but is a little better written, but kind of totally dead. The third one, the first one is called Just Think From Another World. The second is The Think From Another World, Climate of Fear. And the third one is called Eternal Vows, which is absolute crap. Worse than the prequel. Like, it's it's garbage. Um, the internet reviewer Linkara, from uh, on his show Atop the Fourth Wall, reviewed th- all three of them as as far as I yes all three of them. Um, there is another comic that he reviewed later, and uh, that I have not read myself, but it's called The Northam Nightmare. It's another prequel. But it's actually um, a couple thousand years before anything else. And it's ancient Norwegian people, you know, Vikings, essentially, finding the thing. Um, And as far as I remember, that's all the things for the thing. Every piece of media. So... um, that's my opinion on the thing. I love the movie. This short story is all right. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's everything. So, thank you guys for coming to see. I have been Alfred. And I will see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>